Lord Jesus Christ. I get a cold shiver down my spine, you know, and I just thank God um, for the grace that he has put upon my life. Um, an awesome present worship line up there. Thank you so much, uh, technical team. So saints, um, unleashing the uh, communion and offering messages for us this morning is a true ninja of the gospel. My Mandianike, good morning. You are muted. If you can unmute your device. Good morning, Apostle. How are you doing? Doing well, thanks. Doing well, thanks. You're looking very warm. I am warm. <laughs> Thank you. I am very warm. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, please take it away. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning, saints. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are streaming from. Uh, I'm be, I'll be going to, I, I will be sharing with us uh, our communion message. As you can see that our tech team is so prompt, they've put up my first scripture verse already. So this verse, we normally use it mostly when we're doing communion. It may sound as if it's very, we are repeating the same things over and over. But um, remembering what Atlas last shared in his communion message some two weeks back, if not one or two weeks, yes, he was saying it's not, it is profitable, it is good, it's beneficial for us to be doing things over and over again. So now, Apostle Paul, you can read our first scripture for today. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25 from the TPT. I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. The same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and gave thanks. Then he distributed it to the disciples and said, take it and eat your fill. It is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, this cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it. And whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Amen. As we have uh, read from that uh, scripture, we can see that Jesus commanded us to remember him, to remember the sacrifice that he did. In other words, we are saying, what, we, what I'm, I want to share with us today is to, to take that word remember. As we can see that from that scripture, it has been used two times, that remember me when you are breaking the bread, remember me when you are drinking of the cup. So I've uh, titled my, my, my topic, Be More Conscious of the Finished Works of Christ. So now, if he's saying remember, so I had to look up, for this word, remember, from the dictionary. So I came up with four phrases that I'm going to be sharing with you, what this word, remember, is trying to, to, to imply. So the first word is, um, the first phrase is saying, keep alive the memory of someone or something, to keep alive the memory of someone or something. Then my second phrase is saying, show appreciation to. So my third um, a phrase is saying, call to mind. And my fourth phrase is saying, treasure in the memory. So from these four phrases that I chose to, to, to use, we can see that it is, Jesus is, is, is commanding us or is, is calling us to keep in memory or to keep the memory of his finished works on the cross. We have to keep that memory alive. And for us to keep it alive, it means it has to be something that we have to do always. It is something that we have to do regularly. It is something that we have to do continually, or it's something that we have to do persistently. So if we don't do this, whatever that we do, like coming uh, to the table uh, and take communion, if we don't do it regularly, always, or persistently, or, 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 or continually, then it means we are not going to, 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 to partake, or we are not going to, 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 to be able to, to manifest that life that Jesus sacrificed to give us. So now, 
uh, reading my next, uh, putting up our next scripture verse, we are going to read from Philemony verse six. Can you read for us, Apostle Paul? That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now we hear Apostle from the book of Philemon that the communication of our faith may become only effectual by acknowledging every good thing which we have in Jesus Christ. So from my last explanation, as I said before, that if we regularly take this communion and as we keep alive the memory of what the cross brought for us, and as we show uh, appreciation and call to mind and treasure everything and anything that the cross of uh, Jesus or the works of Jesus brought to us, we will be acknowledging every good thing that we have in Christ Jesus. Without acknowledgement, we are not able to recognize what we have in Jesus. So maybe if I can explain further on the word, what the word acknowledge means. To acknowledge is to, 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 to believe or to accept that something is legal or it's true. So if we are not able to, 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 to believe that what Jesus did for us on the cross, we are not, we are not able to, to know who we are in Jesus in Jesus Christ, we are not able to know what, what we were capacitated to do or the abilities that we now have in Christ Jesus. We are not able to know our position in Christ Jesus. So now we can see that this word remembrance, it is a word that will bring us, when we remember the way that Jesus wants us to remember, it will bring us to a place where we acknowledge every good thing that Jesus Christ has for is brought for us. And now we are going to get to read another scripture coming from Proverbs. And I want to believe that this scripture as well is, is, is directing us or is, is, is also telling us that what Jesus said in his words that we need to remember him. It's not just a passage to remember him and leave it like that or it's not passive to just say ah we are remembering jesus as we partake of the, the the body and the blood it's not in the blood in the blood itself and it's not in the body itself but it's in the way that we take and as we remember as jesus said remembering as i said before in my last explanation that is acknowledging and another scripture that apostle uh, is going to read for us now from proverbs is going also to explain this word remembrance that whenever that we are doing communion, what is it just Jesus is asking of us? Amen. Listen carefully, my dear child, to everything that I teach you and pay attention to all that I have to say. Amen. I think the way that I wanted to come out is um, when you, you, you read this uh, scripture to the end, there is a, 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 a statement which says, keep these things in the midst of your heart. So if what Jesus did, we don't pay attention. Paying attention is like, um, I, can, I can maybe give an example that um, there are so many things that are happening around us. Life is happening in this world that we are living in. We've got tribulations, we've got troubles, we've got, there's so much that is around us. But if we don't pay attention to Jesus, or if we don't pay attention to what Jesus Christ did on the cross, our attention is going to be focused on what is around us. So now Proverbs is telling us that we give attention and give ear and fix our eyes on Jesus. And now this Proverbs goes on to say, if you apply all these things that um, Proverbs is telling us to give ear, to, 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 to fix our eyes and to keep whatever that Jesus did on the cross, if we keep it on our hearts, 
then whatever that Jesus did is going to manifest in our flesh. Where it says it will give life to our flesh. So now what, what, what we are saying is saying, is saying it's not only in taking or partaking of the, the elements, it is taking with a paying attention, it's taking with an acknowledgement, it's also taking by meditating as we are going to read our last scripture verse for our communion message. 1 Timothy 4, 15 from the TPT reads, make all of this your constant meditation and make it real with your life so everyone can see that you are moving forward. Amen. I like it in that TPT version where it says, make all of this your constant meditation. Amen. So as we are partaking of the body today and the, 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 the blood of Jesus, may it be a constant meditation of what the cross of Jesus or his finished works on the cross brought for us. In other words, Jesus going on the cross and finishing all the works of the cross brought to us, like um, Pastor Mark put it in, in a message that she's uh, going with, she's saying, God put back on the table the choice. So now Jesus put back the, on, the, on the table our choice to live this life that he came to bring us as opposed to that life that the imposter gardener has, has brought in our lives. So as we partake uh, uh, saints, let, let's acknowledge every good thing that Jesus has brought in our lives. Let's, um, as we partake uh, 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 saints, let's give attention to every thing that Jesus put on the table and let's continue to meditate. And as we do so, definitely we are going to live this life that Christ sacrificed to give us. So if we don't do that, saints, we are not appreciating what Jesus has done for us. So let's appreciate and let's celebrate what Jesus has given us as his children so that we, sh we are going to show forth his glory as he, is, as he had said in his word, that is the waters fill the earth. Shall my glory fill the earth? Shall the waters fill the earth? So shall my glory fill the earth. So how is this glory of God going to be filled on the earth if we are not appreciating what he did on the cross? So let's partake saints with remembrance. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yes. Now moving over to my giving message. Our script, the first scripture is coming from Psalm 119. This Psalm 18. one. Yes. Psalm 119, 89 to 91 from the Amplified Classic. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven, stands firm as the heavens. Your faithfulness is from generation to generation. You have established the earth and it stands fast, and the whole universe are your servants. Therefore, they continue this day according to your ordinances. Amen. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven, and it stands firm. So the word of God, what it says about us with regards to his prosperity, it stands firm in heaven, or oh, it's forever settled, or it is established forever in heaven. So if God has established his word about us in regards to our prosperity, it is settled, saints. So now it is on our part to settle this truth in our lives. So how has this word been settled? forever in heaven and how do on our part settle this word in our lives so that is also established so we are going to read our next scripture verse uh, both verses coming from first corinthians oh sorry 
Yes, you can read for us, Apostle. Uh, Corinthians. From 2 Corinthians? Yes, Second Corinthians, this 8 and 9, then another Corinthians from this, second, the same chapter, but this uh, 9, chapter 9, verse 8. 2 Corinthians, verses 8 and 9 from the Amplified Classic. For, yes, you are becoming pro for you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favor and spiritual blessing, in that though he was so very rich, yet for your sakes he became so very poor, in order that by his poverty you might become enriched, abundantly supplied. Amen. For you are becoming progressively acquainted with and um, knowing that Jesus, he was so rich, living at leaving heaven and coming to earth, he was showing poverty because he had everything in heaven. But he became poor by coming here on earth so that in that poverty that he showed, we might be rich. So this is how Jesus or God in Jesus established that we are rich. So now that we are rich, let's read from the other scripture coming also from Second Corinthians. Yes, Apostle. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Amen. As I've explained before, that Jesus became poor. He became poor so that in his poverty I may be rich. And now he made me rich for what reason? We have seen in that scripture that he wants me to be abundantly supplied. So now it's not scriptural saints to be to, to have enough or to, to have what is adequate or that is enough for you. Scriptural uh, prosperity is where we are in abundance. That whenever we have, in, 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 uh, we are abundantly supplied. We are also able to give. We are also able to, to give and the, the giving that uh, God is pleased with uh, mainly is to est establish his covenant here on earth. And how is his, his covenant established here on earth? Is when we give towards the gospel. As the gospel is being preached, many people are coming in, in, in covenant um, with, with God. So this is the main reason why God has made us prosperous, why God has given to us. Yes, we, we can also give uh, 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 to charity. Yes, it is good for, for, for us because we are showing God that as we are supplied, we are like our father, that we are able also to give because God is the only one who showed us that he can give. He's abundantly supplied that he also gave. And as we are children of God, we also learn from our father that as he, we have been given and we have received, we are also blessed so that we are a blessing to other people. So saints, let's not be comfortable about us having all that we need, but let's be comfortable when we are abundantly supplied that we are also able to give unto God. As, um, as soon as I finish, the, the tech team is going to bring up the ways and various ways and means how we can give so that, so that you, can, you can give in the way that you can show that God is given also to you. Thank you, saints. Amen.
I shall pray for our um, communion and give you encouragement. Heavenly Father, we just want to bless your name today. We blessing your holy name because it is worthy. Our 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 praising it is worthy. Our 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 appreciation it is worthy. Our acknowledging it is worthy that we give honor and glory to your name, O oh Lord, because there is no one like you. There is no one who could have loved us the way that you have loved us. We were still sinners, but you still came to us. You still reached out to us, even when we were not in that acceptable position. But because of your great love in Jesus, Father, you have accepted us. Because you, of your great love, oh God, you have loved us. There is no way that we can feel loved more than you have already loved us in Jesus. Even if now, Father, we have trials, we have tribulations, we have everything that is facing us, we are strong, we are victorious, we are encouraged because we can face it knowing that the one who overcame lives in us. So you gave us this life, Lord, that we may manifest your glory here on earth. So Father, as we always come to the table and to partake of communion, we are in appreciation. We are in thanksgiving. We are in acknowledging every good and perfect work, work that Jesus did for us. So Father, we are forever uh, thankful. We are forever grateful for what you did for us in Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful that you even prospered us, Almighty Father, that we may be able to give so that all the people that Jesus died to give this life may come to you and partake of this life. So Father, we are so thankful. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for that powerful message, my man, Janice. Indeed, we, we need to keep the finished work of, of the cross at the very top of our minds. So thank you for that, uh, for that timely reminder. And uh, this morning, we are continuing along our journey and uh, dialing in from the United Kingdom. We have the newly ordained Mbuya Makamure. Good morning, Pastor Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I like the sound of that, Gogo Makamure. I really love the sound of that. I think the uh, we title praise. sits well on me. <laughs> we praise God. We praise God. So we're Ooh. happy to have you dialing in from abroad. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just ready to continue enjoying the powerful uh, series that you're delivering to us. Please take it away. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome, uh, Apostle Paul, although I know it's very cold in Zim right now, but uh, you've done the miracle of making it a very warm welcome. Uh, they don't call you Apostle for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, welcome to all of, uh, all of our family joining us from all over the world, literally and figuratively right now. Um, Yes, we are thankful for the opportunity to bring the word of God, the word of God, which is living and active to all of us today. And God is so happy that we've got something to pin our lives on, something to be hopeful uh, about, something to look forward to, something to, to really acknowledge every single day the goodness of God in all of our lives. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good opportunity for, just, for us to just be reminded of what Christ has done. And the only way, the, the most important way that God has to keep our memories alive is his word. That is why the title of this series is The Seed is the Word and the Word is the Seed. We're talking about the kingdom of God and we are really emphasizing the fact that the truth that the seed of the word of God is the sure foundation on which we can build all of our lives on. And so over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the seed of the word of God. Initially, when we launched off into this uh, series, we spoke about the sower, the God being the sower, 
um, and we also spoke about him being the sower of life. He's the sower of all good and perfect things. He's the sower of hope. He's the sower of righteousness. He is just the sower of, of all things good in our lives. We then started to talk about the seed a number of weeks ago, and that, that, that seed that the sower sows, that the owner sower sows, that the owner gardener sows is the word of God. And um, we, we launched off from Christ's instruction for us to remember always that the kingdom of God works off the seed principle. And we've been following this seed principle right from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden, through the age of innocence, through the law, through the prophets, through the gospels last week. And basically, we are just trying to persuade ourselves that we cannot participate fully in this kingdom of God apart from his word. The word is the cornerstone of how the kingdom of God works. Our anchor scripture was, uh, two of our, anchors, of, of our anchor scriptures came from Mark 4 verse 14 and Luke 8 verse 11. Mark 4 verse 14, Apostle Paul. The sower sows the word in the Amplified. The sower sows the word of God, the good news regarding the way of salvation. TPT, let me explain. The farmer sows the message of the kingdom, message. The farmer plants the word. Amen. So the sower that is being talked about here is God. He's the sower. He's the sower. He, um, he's the farmer. He's the, he, he's the farmer who sows. He's the farmer who plants. Uh, so we, we have to establish it from the get-go that in the kingdom of God, there is only one sower. And that sower is God. And that sower is still subject to our choice. So we have to choose him to be the owner gardener of our hearts for his word to begin to be sown in our hearts, for our hearts to be receptive, receptive to that seed of the word of God and for our hearts to be, uh, to be able to allow that word that is sown in our hearts to first of all, take root and then sprout out first the blade, then the ear, then the corn on the ear. And then, and only then will that word then bring forth of its own kind in our lives. And I really like that 1 Timothy 4 verse 15, which, I put, which um, my man Janike referred to uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the communion uh, message. It's one of my favorite verses where Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy and, and he say, um, meditate on these things. What are these things that he's talking about? It's the word of God. And then he says, give yourself wholly to it. What is that thing that we must give ourselves wholly to? It is the word of God. And then it's, it goes on to give us an assurance or a, pro, a, a promise, which says that if we meditate on the word of God, if we meditate on this seed of the word of God, if we give ourselves wholly to it, then God assures us that our profiting will become evident to all. It will become evident first to ourselves when we see this uh, mind renewal and when we see the life transformation that happens because of that word in our own lives and then that fruit will also become evident to others so the seed of the word of god is what makes the whole kingdom work the next um anchor scripture that we spoke about that we've been speaking about over and over and over again is Luke 8 verse 11 and I really like how my Manjanike also emphasized what Lantla emphasized a few weeks ago where Apostle Paul says uh, to, to say these things over and over and over to you again is needful and it's profitable. So we may sound like we are saying these things over and over and over again, but what we are trying to do, what God is trying to do in all of our hearts is to persuade us, to bring us to that place of total and complete persuasion where Apostle Paul says, I am persuaded that neither death or life, neither darkness or light, neither nothing can separate me from the from the love of God what is it that God used to persuade Apostle Paul to come to that place it is the seed of the word of God and then we read again uh, in Romans chapter 4 where Abraham is saying be fully persuaded that he who had promised would surely deliver what, what is it that God used to persuade Abraham to that place to bring Abraham to that place of total and complete persuasion is the word of God and right now we continue to repeat some concepts from the word of God. Why? Because it's the only way 
by which we can come to a place of total and complete persuasion. And when we come to that place of total complete persuasion that the word of God is the foundation of all our kingdom life, the, and we start to apply that word in our own lives, we begin to walk in the fullness of everything that Christ died to secure for us on the cross. Luke 8 verse 11, Apostle Paul. Luke 8, 11, New King James. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, amplified. Now the meaning of the parable is this, the seed is the word of God concerning eternal salvation, TPT. Here then is the deeper meaning to my parable. The word of God is the seed that is sown into our into hearts. Message, the story is about some of these people. The seed is the word of God. Amen. And what I so like about all the translations that I've read this passage of scripture from is that they all talk about their seed. They don't talk about a seed giving other seeds as an option for our, uh, for the God kind of life in our lives. It's saying there is the seed, which is the only seed. It's the only seed that when we saw in our hearts, we get the results that God assures. And so we started off the process, the, the whole series by uh, taking a look at the at how the kingdom of God works according to Jesus. And we know that that is the truth. Jesus points us to this system that holds the kingdom of God together where for anyone and for everyone. It is a system that is not selective. It is, it does not, it's, it's not, um, it's not partial. It's, it, it's, it will produce the same results for everyone who chooses to cooperate with this, with it. It is a God guaranteed system. It cannot be cheated. It cannot be, uh, it, it, it cannot be cheated basically if you if god assures us that if we just follow his system this system of a seed we will we are guaranteed of the results that he assures us at the end of it all so the system works this way there is a sower and god says i am the sower he's the sower, the owner gardener of our hearts he's the farmer he's the one who comes with the seed of the word of god which is supposed to be planted in the garden of our hearts that that th those hearts are the ground into which the seed of the word of god can be planted he comes in and he, he instructs us to allow time for that seed to begin to grow and to increase. The Bible says it's first the blade, then the ear, then the corn and the ear. He talks about watering and nourishing that, that seed that is sown in our hearts through prayer, through meditation, and through all the other things that the practices that the word teaches us. And then at the end of it all, God assures us of the increase or, or, the, or the harvest. So at the beginning of that process, we see God as the sower. At the end of that process, we see God as the one who assures us of the harvest and the increase. So this is the process that works for anyone and for everyone. It is not a selective process. It, it, it will not fail because God himself guarantees it. And the invitation that God is, call, is, is, uh, is sending out to all of us is just for us to, part, to participate in the system, to, to become uh, partners with God in this uh, system or in this in following these key or essential components uh, which make his kingdom work in his in our lives and uh, in uh, all over the world so we started off by uh, observing how the seed of the word was initially sown in the heart of the first man or in the first woman in the garden of Eden we call that initial seed the seed of life, and that seed of life was sown by the owner God. Now we, we read um, many passages of scripture from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and we realized that that seed, what the seed that, that created the life of Adam was a spiritual seed. It was the word of God, or it was the truth of his word. It was sown in the spirit of man initially. It was sown in the unseen or innermost part of man's heart. This seed is the spirit expressed which is to be expressed through the through our lives or through their lives uh, in their souls then into their body and we, we saw that man was created and formed to live from the inside out so god first gave man an identity that identity came from the seed of life or the seed of the word of god that god spoke which brought brought man into being and that word 
um, is the seed of life which gave man his identity, his purpose, his capacity, and his boundaries. That was the initial seed by which every man was designed to live right from the beginning. So God shows us a pattern um, after which all the lives of men were supposed to, uh, to, 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 to be patterned. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a formula after which every life of any man thereafter was supposed to be patterned. Our lives were supposed to be patterned in a way that the seed of the word of God is the first and innermost and most important part of our identity. Um, we went on to follow how men then fell by succumbing to the seed of death, which was sown in the hearts of, the, uh, of Adam and Eve by the imposter gardener who is Satan. He came, he also sowed his seed of the word, but that word was satanic lies, and that seed was first sown in the realm of men's senses or in their bodies, uh, and that seed was characterized, uh, characterized by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and we, we, we tracked that seed, and we saw how it weaved its way from the body through the soul of men, and finally to defile the spirit of men or the identity of men as God had given him. So the result of that, of that seed of the imposter gardener, of that seed of the word of satanic lies was that men fell from living from the inside out, which was God's divine design for the prosperity of mankind to living from the outside going in, which led to the fall and which resulted in spiritual death, which is a separation from relationship with God as a result of that seed of death, which men allowed Satan to sow in, a, in, in their hearts. And so we can see that um, the, at any moment of our lives, there are two possible sowers. There's the sower of life who is God, and there's the sower of death who is Satan. And we are right there in the middle of the two sowers as the honor gardeners of our heart. And we exercise our choices daily as to which sower we allow to sow seed in our hearts. And this is uh, something that even God cannot do for us. God gave us choice as part of our image or as part of our likeness with his identity. And that choice, no one, not even God, can take it away. God cannot, cannot, cannot make that choice for us. We have to make that choice for ourselves. And the consciousness that we all must live by is the consciousness of these two sowers who are all trying to sow seed into the garden of our hearts. We, we, uh, by way of recap, again, we spoke about the seed of the word of God being the seed that, that lives on. It's the seed that never dies. Um, it, it, even when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, that seed of the word of God remained alive. Uh, we, talk, we, we spoke about how um, Although God was locked out of relationship with men because of that, um, because of the fall, although he was excluded from spiritual relationship with men because men succumbed to the imposter sower, God didn't just surrender his men to Satan completely. He, he resorted or he found other ways to continue to, to preserve men for, a, for one day, for, for that one day in which relationship with him, with God, could be restored once again. So God resorted to other, to other means to continue to pursue, to continue to sustain, and to continue to preserve man, mankind from utter self-destruction until the promised seed should come, that seed that would be able to restore man back to relationship with God once again. And so the seed of life took on different forms through different dispensations. First of all, it, it became the seed of pursuit, when God continued to pursue Adam and Eve, even after the fall, it became the seed of preservation where God created boundaries beyond which men could not exercise their free will and choice so that he could be preserved with the, uh, with the little life that was, that was left in him even after the fall. We also saw that God continued to sow his seed in men's conscience so that men could have an intuitive knowledge of God, we also saw that how God continued to sow his seed 
in his creation so that men could continue to be sensually alert to the life of God or to the presence of God or to the reality of God. We also saw how God sowed the seed of the law. The Bible tells us that that seed of the law is what drove, what was designed to drive people to grace. It was the school teacher to bring everybody to grace. So it was a seed in a different form. We also saw how the seed of prophecy, the prophetic that was given to promising um, redemption, promising restoration, uh, promising reconciliation through the finished work of the cross, that seed continued again, um, even in the gospel dispensation with the witness, eyewitness accounts or witness testimonies of the apostles that really did work and walk with, with Christ during his earthly ministry. And those testimonies were really that God has come to be with men or God is with us. Last week, we considered the five fold witnesses uh, concerning the sonship of Christ and concerning um, the restoration of our relationship with God through the finished work of the cross. And the fivefold um, uh, witnesses in, uh, included the witness of the Father, the witness of the Son, the witness of the Spirit, the witness of the works, and the witness of the of the Scriptures. And so we 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 continue to 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 to. To, to, to track this seed of the word of God um, uh, through the, the testimonies of the apostles, we continue to, to hear from their eyewitness accounts of how God came to be with men. And the four gospel writers mainly reveal Christ as God with us. They emphasize Jesus' identity as God manifested in the flesh. They confirm that Jesus was the word of God, the seed of the word of God, which was made flesh and came to dwell amongst us or came to dwell with men. And they confirm the fulfillment of all the prophecies that had gone before concerning the coming of Christ. And basically, they, they narrow down the identity of Christ as the seed of a woman, the seed of God, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the son of man, and the savior of the world. And when we tracked these titles or these identities that were, um, that were affixed on Christ, we tracked them right back to the Old Testament from the book of Exodus, from, from, from the law and the prophets. Uh, we, we tracked basically every prophet that spoke in the Old Testament, gave a prophetic word concerning the identity of this Christ who was to come, the one who was going to be the savior of the world. So the sower continues to sow. Um, and last week we considered the fivefold testimony, the personal statements of the father, the personal statements of the son, the witness of the Holy Spirit who descended and remained on Jesus as was spoken by the prophets, uh, the proof of the works, the, the, the signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus performed to confirm his identity as the word of God that was made flesh or the word of God with skin and bone. Um, we also considered the testimonies of the scriptures inspired, the fivefold witness of the identity of Christ as the son of God, the son of man, God manifested in the flesh, the savior of the world and the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies that um, had been spoken before time. And so we continue to track the, the, the seed and the sower. We continue to see that the sower continues to sow the seed of the word of God or the seed of life throughout all the dispensations or throughout the history of mankind. So today we are going to see a different form of seed in a different dispensation. Now we are talking about um, the New Testament uh, dispensation after the gospels. Christ has come, Christ has died on the cross, he has risen, he has ascended and gone back to heaven, having accomplished every single purpose that God the Father has assigned to him. Now we hear the witness of those that re received revelation, a fuller revelation of the work of Christ and its implica implications on all our lives. First of all, we are going to read from Luke 24, verse 44 to 49. Here we are going to beginning to we are going to begin to experience to, to, to learn about the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this is where the Holy Spirit becomes very, very active in, in, uh, in the lives of of men. He, he is the ever present uh, uh, representation of the Godhead in today's 
church in, in today's believer. He is the one who is the representation of all that God is and all that God has. And we see his ministry being launched straight after Jesus goes uh, ascends back into heaven. And his promise was that he would send another just like him to help the believers to continue to receive the seed of the word of God, to continue to relate to God on the basis of the foundation of everything that uh, from which his kingdom works, on the basis of the foundation on which everything about the kingdom of God is established. And so we are going to follow this seed, the seed of life, the seed of the word of God, as it becomes the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, verse 44 to 49, Apostle Paul. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are the witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Amen. These are, one of, these are some of the last few words that uh, Jesus had for his disciples before the ascension. He's saying, um, I am going to go back to my father, but... I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you the promise of my father. So you go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem or wait in the city of Jer Jerusalem until you have received this promise from the father, which will endure you with power from on high. So Jesus is basically talking about the Holy Spirit. He's promising the disciples that there is another who's going to come, another one just like him, although in spirit form, that was going to continue the work uh, that he had started through his ministry, through his sacrifice, through everything that he came to do according to the Father's plan. He's saying, you are going to receive the promise from the Father, one who's going to take over in ministering to you just the same way as I, was, as I have been ministering to you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Let's read on um, Acts 1, verse 4 to 5, and then verse 8, so that we can really convince ourselves that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit here is one who was going to lead the believers into a different dis dispensation, a dispensation where the seed of the word of God would be revealed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who was going to come to become the, fu the, the fullness of the Godhead in dwelling in men in bodily form. Amen. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Amen. So if we read those two passages of scripture together, we can, we can conclude that the promise of the Father that Jesus is talking about in the book of Luke and the promise of the Father, which he's talking about in Acts uh, 1 verse 4 to 5, is the Holy Spirit who was promised to, 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 to all believers that they would, once he came, every believer would be baptized by him if they chose to. And with that baptism would come power um, to become witnesses. So Jesus is, sa is saying, you will become witnesses. You will be able to tell people about me. You will be able to model uh, my life in you to other people. When you have received this promise with the Holy Spirit, who will empower you uh, to, to, to live the God kind of life here on earth that is expected of everyone who has put their faith in Christ. So Jesus promises the Holy Spirit is power from on high, power to become, power to live, power to express, power to, uh, to restore relationship back to where God intended it to be in the first place so that man could find his life in the only life source there is who is God. We're going to read on 
to John 16, verse 7, and then 12 to 14, to see Apostle John's rendering of the same things that Luke is talking about and the, the same um, thought line that we read from, from the book of Acts. We, let's hear how uh, Apostle John presents the same truth uh, so that we can glean as much as we can from this passage of scripture as we launch into this seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Amen. So we see here how Apostle John, Apostle John puts it in a way that we can begin to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament dispensation or in the gospel dispensation or in the dispensation of grace or in the word of faith dispensation. He says um, the, the spirit of truth would come and that spirit of truth would guide us into all truth. He would speak not on his own authority, he would, he would speak only on the authority of the father or of the sower. Um, and whatever he hears, he will speak. And it goes on to say, he will tell of the things to come. And Jesus is very clear in that instruction that there are things that we could not bear with. We could not understand, we could not appreciate, we could not acknowledge, we could not wrap our little brains around without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the revelator who was going to come or the Holy Spirit who was going to come was going to reveal certain things that we, mankind had no capacity to understand. And the promise is that he would guide us. He will speak, he will tell, and he will declare. So that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the grace dispensation or in the church age but he's not revealing anything new. He's just revealing to us the seed of the word of God that had been from the beginning, that had changed form and shape throughout the different dispensation. But in this church age, the Holy Spirit is given to restore the fullness of that appreciation of the word of God so that we can, every believer can start to live in the fullness of everything that Christ secured for us on the cross. We go on to read from Acts 2, verse 1 to 4, to um, we are still talking about the seed of the revelation under the inspiration, and we, we begin to see the work of this, uh, of the Holy Spirit, or this, this, this uh, part of the God with that, that, of the Godhead that was sent to empower us to live the God kind of life here on earth, that was sent to empower us to live lives that evidence our profiting from the death, burial, and resurrection, and then the ascension of Jesus Christ. This is uh, this passage of scripture is showing us um, a, a, a view of the disciples under the influence of the Holy Spirit who had come to, to, to reveal the, the, the seed of the word, to give them understanding of the seed of the word and to enable them to begin to live in the fullness of that seed of the word of God in their lives. Acts 2 verse 1 to 4, the disciples under the influence. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. So we, we see here that there are two key results of the Holy Spirit baptism which the disciples received. The first thing is that um, they received utterance or they received the ability to speak. They, uh, he, the Holy Spirit gave them words. He, 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 uh, we can see here that the Holy Spirit came to give them the seed of the word of God. So he, the Holy Spirit is the gift that came bearing the gift of the seed of the word of God. That is what the Holy Spirit gave to the disciples. And then the second um, uh, uh, result of the Holy Spirit baptism that we see from that passage of scripture is that they began to speak. They opened their mouths to speak and they were speaking words that they had received from the Holy Spirit as the seed of the word of God. 
And, and so we can see here that they, they received words from the Holy Spirit and then they began to speak and to give others those same words that the Holy Spirit had given them. So the Holy Spirit came to reveal the word of God once again to them, to give them the word of God, to give them an understanding of the word of God so that they could speak the same word, word of God and begin to sow it uh, to, uh, in the hearts and in the minds of other people. And that is how the word of God was going to continue to procreate of itself through the ministry of these disciples. And so from that passage of scripture, we want to refer back to, the, to Luke uh, 24, verse 44 to 49, which we read earlier on. In that passage of scripture, Jesus was promising that they would receive, they would receive power from on high. And in this passage, Acts 2, verse 1 to 4, we see that the, the Holy Spirit came, baptized them, and gave them words. So we can see the link here that that is, that is those words which they received from the Holy Spirit that came embedded with the power from on high. So the power from on high is really found in the word or in the words that the Holy Spirit gave them to utter or to speak. So we can, we can draw a, a, a parallel here that without the Holy Spirit, without the ministry of the Holy Spirit, without the revelation of the seed of the word of God, there is no power by which to live this life that God has secured, that Christ secured for us to live and the, the life that God so desires for us to live, a life that is profited, profitable, a life that evidences the goodness of God, uh, a life that proclaims that there is a good God and that God wants relationship um, with every human being that he created, a life that shows off the goodness and the glory of our God here on earth. So embedded in the word that the Holy Spirit that inspired the disciples to speak, to receive, and then to speak was the power that God had promised. That power that is released through revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we can see a link here that the Holy Spirit which Jesus promised to come, the Holy Spirit that would come to endure them with power, came and what the first thing that he did is he gave them words, he gave them utterance. And when they received and submitted to those words which they received from the Holy Spirit, they also in turn gave others the same words. So we can see here that the first influence of the Holy Spirit is the seed of the word of God. He, in, he influenced them to speak, he influenced them to use their tongues, he influenced them to utter. So we can see here that the ministry of the Holy Spirit came to bring the seed of the word of God to, and to make it alive again in our lives. So we are still checking that seed of life. We are still following the seed of the word of God to, and we have followed it through the different dispensations to the grace dispensation that we are living now or the faith dispensation that we are living now or the word of faith dispensation that we are living in now. We want to read from Acts 2 verse 8 um, 11 and 13 to see the effect of the Holy Spirit on Peter, one of the disciples. We want to see how Peter lived under the influence of the Holy Spirit, having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, in the upper room with together with the other disciples. Acts 2, verse 8, 11 and 13. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful things, the wonderful works of God. Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Amen. So this is just after the, the disciples have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says they, they all began to speak in different tongues. Now, this is the testimony of those that were around listening to them. They, they testify that they each heard them speaking in their individual languages. And what were they speaking? What were they uttering? The actions that they were given by the Holy Spirit, what was the content of it? It's clarified in that verse that they all spoke in different languages about the wonderful works of God. So they spoke the word of God. The works of God are contained in the word of God. So they are at the actions that they received caused them to confess the wonderful works of God. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the, the disciples, and in this instance, Peter, began to speak the wonderful works of God, began to sow a revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of the seed of the word of God. It, they began to, sh to, to share the character of God. They began to share 
the, the, the nature of God, they began to share the works of Christ, the finished work of, work of Christ. They began to share the goodness of the kingdom of God. So we see here that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit caused a revelation to come to the disciples, which overflowed in the confessions that they then made concerning the wonderful of work of God in their lives. Let's read further in Acts 2, verse 15, 17, and then 21, to really get to understand what the immediate impact of the infilling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit was to the disciples who were under the influence. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So we hear from uh, Acts 2, verse 8, 11, and 13, that they began to speak in different languages or in different tongues about the wonderful works of God. And then further down in uh, verse 15 to 17 and 21, we begin to hear Peter referring back to the Old Testament prophet Joel, uh, and he's be beginning to shed light under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or under revelation received by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's beginning to bring the Old Testament prophecy to the present and beginning to give people a good understanding of what God meant when he spoke or he sowed the seed of prophecy through the mouth of uh, Apostle Joel. And he's saying, this is what the prophet spoke. This is the word of prophecy, the seed of the word of prophecy that the, the prophet Joel spoke long a long time ago. This is the reality of it. And so, um, Peter is beginning to shed light on the prophetic concerning the gospel of salvation by grace alone through faith in Christ alone. And he's beginning to reveal and to preach the same gospel that, uh, that the Old Testament dispensation uh, could not fully appreciate or fully understand. But now with the empowerment from the Holy Spirit done, but now with the revelation that comes by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's beginning to unpack things that were mysterious, things that could not be understood as they were spoken in the old dispensation of the prophetic age. He's saying, this is the re reality of the prophecy of Joel. So what Apostle Peter is basically saying is God has been consistent. He has been sowing this seed ever since time immemorial. But because we did not have the, under the ability to understand whatever the prophetic message was at the time, now with the help of the Holy Spirit, now with the inspiration or the revelation received from the Holy Spirit, we can now confidently tell you that what you have seen or what you have experienced is the, is the result or the harvest of the seed of the word of God that was sown through the mouths of the prophets a long time ago. Let's go further to Acts 2, verse 25, 29 to 33, and then 36. Again, we are following Peter under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We want to really get to understand that the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is the seed that is operating in our lives today. Acts 2, verse 25, 29 to 33, and then 36, Apostle Paul. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he, both, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would rise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
Amen. So under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Peter begins to unpack the prophetic word that David had given in the Old Testament concerning the coming of Christ. And he's saying that David was really talking about the resurrection of Christ, although that message sounded mysterious at the time, although that uh, mankind were incapable of fully understanding it, although mankind could only receive partial revelation of that promise, he's saying, now we can confirm, now we can tell you under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who has come to reveal that David was really talking about the resurrection of Christ. He was talking about a Christ who would come, who would be uh, crucified, who, who would be buried, who would be raised up on the third day, and who would be received uh, by the Father so that the Holy Spirit the, or the promise of the Holy Spirit would come and be poured out to us, which is what you have experienced or witnessed today. So um, Apostle Peter is uh, referring back again to the prophetic word which the patriarch David had spoken concerning the coming of the Messiah or the coming of the word made flesh or the coming of God manifested in the flesh as Christ. And he is saying, now that we have received the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we can confidently tell you that David preached the gospel even in the Old Testament dispensation. We just had no capacity to understand it. We just had no capacity to process it. And we had no capacity to even apply it in our lives. Why? Because the price or the penalty had not been fully paid. Now, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter is saying everything that God promised through the prophetic voice of David back then has been fulfilled now and we have received a complete and total revelation of it that David was actually not talking about himself. He was talking about the Christ who would come and become the sacrifice for all sin, for all mankind. So he, he, he he's, he's beginning to draw out the gospel message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, even from the prophetic word that was spoken in the Old Testament. We follow that seed again, um, uh, uh, and we, we, we consider the case study of Peter and John under the influence in Acts 3, verse 11 to 12, 14 and 16. Acts 3, verse 11 to 12, 14 and 16. What are we doing? We are still continuing to follow the seed of the word of God right from the Garden of Eden through the fall, through the age of innocence, through the, uh, the law and the prophets, through the gospel uh, dispensation. Now we, are, uh, we, have, we have followed the seed into its current state, the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the church age or the grace dispensation. Acts 3, Apostle Paul. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch that which is called Solomon, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Amen. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Apostle Peter and Apostle John have just healed a man who's, who's been lame for a long time. And uh, there are people who are around them who have witnessed this event. And Apostle, Paul, Ap Apostle Peter is now revealing what has just transpired. He is saying um, there is a partnership that God has always intended to have with mankind. This is the kind of partnership that God created in the Garden of Eden when he sowed the seed of life in the life of the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. And he's saying that partnership has been God's desire and intention all through the ages. And it is manifesting now. Why? Because Christ has come. He has paid the penalty of sin. He has paved the way for reconciliation with God. He has reconnected us back to our life source. And once again, the partnership between God and man is dominating the earth, has been restored or has been renewed. And he's basically saying it's faith in Jesus Christ, that faith releasing power through men to release healing to this, to this man who was lame and um, 
and who was uh, uh, who, who 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 needed the touch of God in his life on that day. So Apostle Paul is saying, Apostle Peter is basically saying, we have been brought to that place once again because the Holy Spirit of, has come because we can, we are now capable of relating with God as equals without a feeling of guilt or shame, without. Um, if, uh, without a feeling of being inferior to God, we can now relate and fully uh, understand or receive by revelation everything that God intended for us. He's saying be, by the seed of revelation of the word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we've been brought to that place once again where we can be God's true and total representation here on earth. We have been brought again into uh, that relationship with God that allows him to flow through us and to touch the lives of people around us by the seed of the word of God, in this case, the seed of healing. And so Apostle Peter is saying, we, they, we have come into that place or into that dispensation where God's will can be, uh, can be established here on earth as it is in heaven, but he, he, he focuses us on, on the partnership. He focuses on men's um, uh, role in bringing the will of God to pass in this life through the seed of the word of God all, all the same, because the Bible tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so Apostle Peter is saying that faith which came by the seed of the word of God, that faith which they as God's representatives on earth had exercised to lay hands on the man who was lame so that he could receive healing. These are, and he's saying, these are the wonderful works of God that have become possible. Why? Because we have received complete and total revelation of the seed of the word of God under the inspiration of, uh, of the Holy Spirit so that we can step up and step into our role as God's representatives on earth. And so in other words, Apostle Peter is saying, without men, God won't, he won't influence here on earth, he, he, he is limited in his ability to, to operate here on earth. Why? Because he does not have a physical body. But at the same time, he's saying without God, man can't. So he's revealing to us how the word of God can only work through men to touch the lives of other men around us. So Apostle Peter and Apostle John begin to have a revelation of their role in the will of in causing the will of God to come to pass here on earth and in causing redemption and freedom to be uh, to, to be expressed through them from God to other people around them who, who were in bondage. They, they are bringing us back to the seed of revelation as the seed that is at work in our grace dispensation or in our church age. We're going to read again from, we are still tracking the seed of revelation. Now we are in the book of Acts chapter three, verse 11 to 12, sorry, chapter three, verse 18 to 19, and then 22 to 26. Again, it's Apostle Peter under the influence. He's under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And we just want to glean from the words that he spoke and the things that he did to, to and, and, and to establish the fact that we've been trying to persuade ourselves on over and over and over again, that the seed remains the word of God. It takes different forms in different dispensations, but it remains the seed of not in the, in the kingdom of God. Acts 3, verse 18 to 19, then 22 to 26. Acts 3, 18 to 19, 22 to 26. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has he had thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with, your, with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first. God raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. 
Amen. So Peter is still speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He's still revealing what the Holy Spirit has revealed to him under, under inspiration. And he's saying um, the whole Bible is talking about Jesus. He's, he's basically saying, in short, Jesus is the message of the whole Bible. It's, he's not just the message of the gospel, of the four gospels. He's not just the message of the epistles. He's not just the message of, um, of, the, of the law and the prophets. He's the message right from the beginning. He is the second Adam. Um, he's the message of all of God's prophets. He's the message that Moses was trying to, 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 to share. He's the message that Samuel sh shared. He's the message that Abraham received from God. And that message is Jesus. So this is what Apostle Peter is trying to express to these people, to, to the people around him. He's saying Jesus is the culmination of the seed of the word of God right from the beginning. He's also declaring that that seed of the word of God was sown by the mouth of all prophets, which means it was sown by the words that the prophets spoke. And um, he's talking about that seed that was heard by the ear. So he's talking about words that were spoken and that were received by ear. He talks about the words that many have spoken concerning and foretelling of the coming of Christ. And so Apostle Peter is drawing uh, our attention or their attention to the seed of the word of God that God had spoken through the law, through the prophets. And he's saying, this is the culmination. Jesus is the culmination of the seed of prophet, of all the seed of, of prophecy. He's the culmination of every seed of the word of God that, is, that God has spoken throughout the different dispensation. Every seed of the word of that God had spoken was pointing to Christ. And uh, we can see here that the, the Holy Spirit is really emphasizing that Christ has, the, has been the seed of the word of God all along. Um, it's, uh, throughout the dispensations, it, 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 even though men had no capacity to fully understand what God was trying to say to them, uh, Apostle Peter and all the other apostles are, are basically saying, now we are living in a dispensation where the Holy Spirit has been given to give us a complete and understanding uh, of the word of God so that we can meet together the seed of the word of God and track it right from the beginning up to now so that we can come to that place of total and complete persuasion that God's relationship with man can only work as God designed it to work through the word of God. Let's go on to Acts 4 verse 8 and uh, 10 to 12 to see uh, we are following again the life of Peter under the influence of the Holy Spirit and we are persuading ourselves that in our dispensation now is the seed of the revelation under the inspiration of the word of God that will cause us to begin to live in the fullness of everything that God desires for our lives and to begin to live in the fullness of everything that Christ secured for us in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Acts 4, verse 8, and then 10 to, 11, to, to, to 10 to 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you all. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. So Peter, under the influence, is unpacking this chief cornerstone. He is saying Jesus is recorded in the word as the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the corner, the chief cornerstone. And he's saying, I'm unpacking that term, the chief cornerstone, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I'm giving you understanding that that chief cornerstone referred to one and only one who's Jesus Christ, the author of all salvation. And so he's revealing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the seed who was to come, the seed who is Jesus Christ, the word that was made flesh has come to make salvation possible, to make our resurrection from the dead possible, to make healing available and to bring wholeness once again to mankind. And so uh, Apostle, Apostle Peter is basically linking Jesus to all the prophetic word that had been given concerning a cornerstone who would be reject, rejected by the builders 
but on whom the salvation of all mankind would be founded. He, we go on to Acts 4, verse 23 to 26. Now we are going to observe the apostles under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the group of them that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We want to observe how the baptism affected them and how the Holy Spirit manifested in their lives to, con to continue to persuade ourselves that in this dispensation, the seed of revelation is the seed of choice for believers today. Acts 4, verse 23 to 26, then 29 to 31. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is within them, who by the mouth of your servant, David said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now, Lord, look on their, heart, on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Amen. So we see the result of uh, apostles now under the influence um, of the Holy Spirit. We see the results of the work of the Holy Spirit, the, the seed of revelation in their lives, the inspiration that made, that changed them to become a whole different kind of people after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see that um, they, they begin to, to declare that David spoke concerning the coming of Christ. He prophesied about Christ. And they begin to, to, to shed light on the word that David spoke under the inspiration, temporary inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but he was really foretelling or speaking forth the truth of a Christ who was to come. And um, we see that the, 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 in, the impact of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was first of all to give them boldness or to empower them, like we read earlier on from the book of Luke and Acts. They were empowered or they were emboldened or they were given the confidence and the courage and the boldness to, to do what? To speak the word. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is really a ministry that gives us utterance to speak the word or to declare the oracles, the oracles of, of God. And it, it, uh, that, that passage of scripture also tells us how they spoke that word. It says, by stretching out your hands to heal, by signs and wonders uh, that may be done through the name uh, of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. So the, uh, apostle, the apostles are beginning to shed light on how God speaks his word through us today. That we, he doesn't only speak by word, he speaks by signs and wonders. The Bible also tells us in another passage of scripture that God um, confirmed the word that they spoke with signs and wonders following. So the word that was spoken continued to be spoken through the signs and wonders that followed that word. Uh, through the signs that way and wonders that way done through the name of Jesus Christ. So the Bible is telling us that after the infilling of the Holy Spirit or after the, 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 the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus began to speak, first of all, through the mouths of the apostles, but he also began to speak through the miracles, through the signs and through the wonders. So the impact of the Holy Spirit baptism in the lives of the apostles apostles was the declaration of the seed of the word of God, was the clarity they brought to the Old Testament prophecies that came clouded, that came as if mysterious, but had been brought to light by the revelation that they received under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5 verse 27 to 32, we are still tracing this seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's hear what, uh, what happened to Apostle Peter still under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Acts 5, verse 27, to 32, Apostle Paul. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, 
we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Amen. So here we hear how the, Holy, the ministry of the Holy Spirit empowered the disciples, and in Peter in particular, to become a witness. And what did he do in witnessing? The Bible is telling us that he taught. He taught, he spoke, uh, he shared a doctrine, and that doctrine was shared in words. And so we can see here that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, having received revelation of all the things that appeared mysterious in the Old Testament scriptures, Apostle Peter is saying everything that the law and the prophets spoke was pointing to Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, who, you, who was crucified, who God raised, and who is now exalted as prince and savior of the world. And he's saying because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, because of his revelation, because of his inspiration, now we are able to witness, to be witnesses by the word that we speak, the word that he gives us to utter, the utterance that we have received from the Holy Spirit, which is the utterance of the seed of the word of God being revealed in its fullness because of the, of, of the Holy Spirit who's ministering in us. And so he's saying, being a witness of Christ, we have become teachers, we have become preachers, we, we are teaching and preaching the Lordship of Christ and the power of his word in the lives of mankind today. And so Apostle Peter is basically saying, we have received the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it's that seed that has enabled us to, first of all, to understand what, was, what had been uh, aforesaid by the many prophets in the different dispensation, uh, dispensations. Now we, can under, we have come to understand that they were all talking about the salvation that can only be found in Christ. And it's the same seed of the word of salvation, the word of grace, the word of faith, the word that the, recon, the conciliatory word that God is preaching through Jesus Christ, that is the word that we are sharing with you today. And so we continue to see that that word under the revelation of the Holy Spirit continues to be the seed on which everything uh, in the kingdom of God is founded. Let's go on to Acts 7, verse 51 to 52. Again, Apostle Peter is still under the influence. He's talking about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ, the different dispensations, etc. And he's referring back to the Old Testament prophets. And he's basically saying that they were talking about this one man. Um, Acts 7, verse 51 to 52, Apostle Paul. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your hearts and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Amen. So Apostle Peter is saying the Old Testament prophets were inspired, temporarily inspired by the Holy Spirit then to prophesy about the coming of Christ. He's saying they always spoke, speaking about the coming of Christ. They were all appointed to the coming. They were all, they all pointed to the coming of Christ. They were all appointed to foretell the coming of the Savior or the just one, according to that passage of scripture. And he's saying in all the dispensations, the Holy Spirit is the chief witness of the, the, the identity of Christ, his ministry, his work, his accomplishments. And he is the chief witness of the work of Christ in our lives. So Apostle, Paul, Apostle Peter, sorry, under the influence is again emphasizing the ministry of the Holy Spirit as the revealer of the things that were mysterious in the past, as the revealer of the seed of the word of God that mankind were not capable of fully understanding in the past. He's saying, we've got a helper now, we've got the promise of the Father now. We, we can now live in the reality of everything that appeared clouded or everything that appeared mysterious. Now God has given us the ability to tap into that which we've could not understand in the past. Now with understanding, we can begin to meditate on these things, on these things as the Holy Spirit inspires us. We can begin to give ourselves wholly to, to them by choice. And as we do so, the God kind of life that is already resident in our spirit will find expression 
through our souls and through our bodies so that our profiting or the goodness of God in our lives will become evident to all so that the seed of the word of God will gain expression through our souls and through our bodies to begin to touch the lives of those around us. So Apostle Peter is saying the overflow of that seed of revelation is that our, our minds are renewed and our lives are transformed. And as an overflow of that transformation, we are able to go out and lay our hands on the sick and they will recover. We are able to go out and cause that life of Christ in us to impact the lives of those that are broken, those that are in bondage, those that are in lack, those that are sick. We can begin to allow that life to overflow through us as the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit begins to work its way in, in our lives. Acts 8, verse 26 and 29 to 31, 34 to 40. It's a bit of a long passage of scripture, but we really have to, to, to go through it so that we can, we can continue to persuade ourselves that the seed that is at work in our lives today or the seed that is um, appropriate for our dispensation today is the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not a different seed uh, from all the seed that God um, has, uh, had been sowing or has been sowing since the day of creation is the same seed. Now we just have uh, the ability to receive its fullness in revelation and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's take it away, Apostle Paul. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. So the eunuch asked Philip and said, I ask you of whom does the prophet say this of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at this, at this scripture preaching Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now, when they came out from the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was founded as a, as a trust, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Amen. So we see here, Philip, um, he has encountered the Ethiopian eunuch, and uh, he, he's beginning to share from the overflow of the revelation um, of everything that the prophets and the, the law and the prophets had spoken concerning the Christ to come, he's beginning to share and to shed light on uh, a passage of scripture which the eunuch had been reading without understanding. So we can see here that under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Philip received revelation of, G, of the teaching on, on Jesus, even from the Old Testament. He's, he's referring to the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah in, in particular, as a message concerning Jesus Christ. He's preaching Jesus right from the Old Testament and is beginning to give the revelation that he had received from the Holy Spirit himself. He's beginning to share the same with the eunuch and, and he's preaching to the eunuch the sonship of Christ is the only means uh, of, of salvation. And he is beginning that teaching or he's beginning that sermon from the Old Testament. He's beginning that sermon from the book of Isaiah. So we can see here that the power of salvation is released when Apostle Philip opens his mouth to share what he had received by revelation from the Holy Spirit, the seed of, of the word of salvation that he had received from by revelation through the Holy Spirit is beginning to share that scripture or that message or that gospel with this eunuch. And what is the response of the seed of the word of God that is preached to the eunuch by Philip under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He believes and he is saved. And so uh, he, the, 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 uh, basically Apostle, sorry, the, uh, Philip is saying to the, to the eunuch that everything that you will read without understanding in the, in the Old Testament and in the laws and, and the law and the prophets, 
is really Jesus Christ. He is the message of the Bible. And under revelation by the Holy Spirit, he's able to unpack the gospel message, even from the Old Testament. So <laughs> I shudder to think why anyone would ever think that the Old Testament is irre irrelevant to our, to our dispensation today. It's so important for us to get an understanding of all the prophetic word that God spoke in the Old Testament. Why? Because it works to persuade us of the uh, of the infallibility of the word of God, it works to persuade us of the, of the truth that God has never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It helps to, uh, to persuade us of the goodness of God throughout all the dispensations. It helps to persuade us that God's plan and purpose for humanity has never changed. And so Apostle uh, Philip is sharing this truth with the, with the, with the Ethiopian eunuch, his response is to the seed of the word of God is that he believes and he is saved. And the Bible is telling us that this is the same message that he, uh, Philip took to, uh, to Azotas and wherever else in the cities he preached. He was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ from whatever part of the Bible uh, it was found. And so we can see that the sonship of Jesus is really the message of the whole Bible. And that revelation, that Jesus is the message of the whole Bible is a seed of revelation, which is in particular uh, applicable to our dispensation where the fullness of God is being revealed to us for the benefit of all mankind. Uh, Acts 9 verse 17 to 18, uh, we, we now hear from Apostle Paul under the influence um, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's read from that passage of scripture, Apostle Paul. And Ananias went on his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Amen. So the background of Apostle Paul is that before he encountered Jesus, he, was the, he describes himself as the Pharisee of Pharisees. He says uh, concerning the law, his knowledge was impeccable, meaning that he, he knew he, and understood the Old Testament scriptures to the T. He, he had been schooled under Gamaliel, uh, one of the strongest and one of the best teachers of the law and the prophets according to the sect. And so Apostle Paul is saying, uh, Apostle Paul encounters Jesus. And then Ananias came to, to minister to Apostle Paul under the instruction of God. And he's ministering about Jesus. He's sharing about uh, the, 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 the goodness of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. He's, he's sharing about salvation that is found only in the just one. And the Bible is telling us that as he is sharing, as Ananias is sharing from the overflow of the seed of revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and as Apostle Paul is exposed to this word of grace of this gospel of, of Jesus Christ, the Bible says his sight was res restored. And it also says that something like scales fell from his sight. And um, that, that denotes the, 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 the revelation that he received even from the word of God that Ananias shared with him under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So uh, he, he, he received that revelation. He was born again. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he became a, the, the biggest proponent of the sonship of Christ and the, 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 the truth of Christ being as being the only means of salvation for all mankind. And so we can see here that the Bible says, Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the same Jews from which he came who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So Paul has received the revelation of the seed of, of the word of God that was made flesh, who is Christ is the only means of salvation. Because of that, <clears throat> From the overflow of that revelation, he goes back to the Jews that, uh, with whom he was partnering in uh, persecuting the church, in whom he was partnering in, uh, in, in de denying and de uh, declining the, the lordship of Jesus Christ. Um, 
he is he's, he's going back to take a different message. Why? Because he has encountered someone who had encountered the Holy Spirit. So the seed of the word of God, the seed of salvation became clearer to Saul because he received it from one who had received a clear revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of that same seed, which Paul was using formerly to persecute the church. And so we can see here that an encounter with the seed of revelation will completely uh, re renew our minds and it will completely transform our lives. And it is the message that the world needs today. Acts 9 verse 17 to um, Acts 10 verse 38 to 43, we see Peter again under the influence. He's still talking about Christ being the culmination of all the law and all the prophets. He is saying this is the, re the revelation that God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is giving us that Christ has always been the seed of the word of, of, of God. Acts 10 verse 38 to 43. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for god was with him and we are witnesses of all things which he did in the land of the jews and in jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree him jesus raised up on the third day him god raised up on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but to witnesses chosen before by god even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Amen. So Apostle Peter again refers us to the Old Testament prophets. He's saying the seed of prophecy that God sowed in that dispensation has become the reality of the seed of the word of God, which was made flesh and now uh, and, uh, came to dwell among men. Who, th that seed of the word of God made flesh being Christ. And so he's saying all the prophets of old prophesied and witnessed about Christ. The message of all Old Testament prophecy is really Christ. And um, without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or with, without the seed of revelation, which comes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, no one would be able to tie those ends, to tie the loose ends of the Old Testament and to bring them back to the reality of the New Testament, who is Christ. So uh, in this dispensation, the apostles under the, influ under the influence of the Holy Spirit are basically just telling us that even in our lives, the seed of revelation is the seed that will cause every word every seed of the word in different dispensations to come alive in our lives. The last scripture that we are going to consider today is Acts 13, verse 22 to 23, Apostle Paul under the influence. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Amen. So Apostle Paul goes back to the seed of the word of God. Um, the seed of the word of God is spoken to David and through David. And he is saying that seed, the prophetic seed of the past, spoken through David, has become, has culminated or has brought forth the harvest of Jesus Christ, who is both Lord and savior of the world. Amen. 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 A powerful message. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that message, Pastor Mac. Um, you know, the series just continues to excite me about the word and the potential we can unleash in ourselves if we just go deeper in the word of God, you know, and access all that the Lord Jesus Christ has um, availed to us mm -hmm. through the finished work of the cross. Um, I've got a question, really. I think it, it, this, this lesson gives us an opportunity to perhaps allow you to address a, a question that we get a lot when we are you know, teaching the word of God to students. And, and that it's a two-part question, but the first part of the question really is, are we saying that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a different experience to being born again? Uh, maybe if you can just start with that one. Yes, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a different experience and it's a necessary experience for every believer because it's, 
It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that enables us not only to understand what God, what the word of God is saying to us, but also to be able to apply it. Uh, and when you look at the life of Peter, Peter is the one who was timid uh, before the crucifixion, crucifixion of Christ. Peter was very timid. He was very scared. He would not even admit that he was one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, remember that uh, interaction that he had with the servant girl by the fire. He was a very scared man. But the Peter that we see now in the book of Acts is a totally different story completely. He's got the boldness. He's, he's the chief proponent of Christ. He's, uh, he, he's not scared anymore. Um, the Bible tells us uh, of many instances when he was thrown into prison. Uh, he's, he, he, he's not afraid anymore to stand for what he believes. And that is the difference that the Holy Spirit can make in the life of any believer. He works the same for, for all of us. There is no partiality, the Bible tells us, with God. And we can, we can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and begin to live another life, a life which is truly Christ-like because of his inspiration and under his, under his revelation. Amen. Amen. So um, part B of the question, the, when then were the disciples born again? Okay, so the, the Bible tells us uh, in Romans uh, 10, verse 9 to 10, that a person gets born again when first of all, they believe that Jesus is the son of God and that God raised him from the dead. Okay, so did the apostle believe that Jesus was Jesus when he came back from the dead? Yes, they did. Did they confess that Jesus was the son of God? Yes, they did. So they were born again. Because if it, for them not to be born again, they should have denied that Jesus was the same resurrected Christ. And we, we hear the confession of, of Peter in one of the, uh, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say I am? And then they said, oh, some say you are, uh, you, you are, you are, you are, Jonah, some say you are whatever identity they ascribe to him. And then Jesus turns around and asks them, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That, the first, that is the first confession. And then oh, as Peter is preaching, we can, we can see, we can hear that he acknowledges that Christ was raised from the dead. And we know that Christ presented himself to all his disciples after his resurrection. And they acknowledged that he had been risen from the dead, which means the two conditions for the rebirth, they, they met. And the Bottom. third confirmation is that uh, in, the book of, uh, in the book of Luke, we hear Jesus promising all the believers that they would receive another comforter from on high. So the qualification to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that one needs to be born again. So you cannot receive the Holy Spirit if you are not born again. So the fact that the the, the, the disciples received the baptism of the Holy Spirit just tells us that they were born again. Even though perhaps when we search the scriptures, we may never see a, a place where there was an altar call and they all came, uh, responded to the altar call and then they all know. <laughs> the fact that they received the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit means that according to God, they were born again. Amen. 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 Completely satisfied. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. We, we get that question often as we are discipling people. My Zulu, is that your hand that is up? It's my Mandia Nikki's hand that is up. Please go ahead. Yeah, just in addition to what Pastor Michael was um, answering to your question, uh, I've got a contribution on your question, which, uh, which you said you were asking when then were the disciples uh, born again? Is that so? Yes. Is that the yes. question? Yes, yes. That was the question. So, yeah, there's a, there's a passage of scripture in John, it should be John chapter 20, where it was the first encounter of Jesus with the disciples after his resurrection. Because after Mary had gone to the, to the, to the tomb and he found, um, he, didn't, he didn't find Jesus, but just the clothes, and also John, I think, was it John and Peter who went and they didn't find Jesus in the tomb. So when Mary went to tell them where Jesus was going to meet them, they, they went there and Jesus, when they were sitting and the doors were closed and everything, Jesus came in there. And the yes. first thing that Jesus did, 
was to breathe on them. He said, um, um, receive, the, receive the Holy Spirit. So I would want to believe that's when they received the, 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 the not receiving the baptism of those, but the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not in, in the second, uh, what, what, not, 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 the, not the second, what can I say? Not in the second instance, but the first instance of being born again. Yes, they were believing on Jesus in everything, his miracles and everything as they were walking the earth with Jesus. But the, 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 the born again experience, they received it when he breathed, breathed, breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Just like when Jesus, when, sorry, when God in Genesis, when he, he took the, 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 the soil and he breathed on, on, on Adam and he became a living soul. So I want to believe that's when they were born again. And also, if we want to, 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 to explain further, we look at Thomas. Thomas was not in the midst of these disciples when Jesus breathed on them. So when they met Thomas, they, they told him they met Jesus. They said, ah, I don't believe that. I'll believe when I see his, his, his hands, the wounds on his hands and the, the way he was pierced on the side. So when he said that, when Jesus saw him, the first thing that Jesus said, so, um, so he said, Thomas, come and feel my, my palms and my side. So after, when Thomas felt the, the palms of Jesus and saw the wounds in the side, they said, now I believe. So now we can say uh, Thomas believed on the resurrected Jesus. So he was also born again because it's on believing on the resurrected Jesus that makes us born again. So when Thomas believed, that, that's when Jesus said to him, blessed are those who believe even if they don't have sin, but you are believing because you have sin. So I want to believe that the time that the, 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 the disciples were born again was when Jesus breathed on them. And also for, for Thomas, who, was, who wasn't amongst the other disciples, he believed on the resurrected Jesus. Amen. Thank you for that contribution. Um, Saints, we have plowed straight into our discussion segment. So please feel free to, uh, to contribute. You may raise your hands uh, in the participation area or you may post comments and I will get them. Um, Mr. Mac, or Sekuru Mac, <laughs> your, uh, <laughs> your hand is up. Please go ahead. Thank you, thank you indeed, Sekuru Mac. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We thank the Lord. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, um, uh, Mark for for the word and and for the teaching. Um, yeah, I just made a few notes here, and I uh, was um, enjoying myself as I was listening. That indeed, right from the beginning today, and <clears throat> I think always, as 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 the scriptures that you were sharing say, the word is the seed, and the seed is the word. But what, what, what then I added on as I was making my notice, <clears throat> just simply that when I receive the Holy Spirit or when anybody receives the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit now acts. The Holy Spirit now enables. And in that, in that way, it's like the, the Holy Spirit gives power to live and act according to God's plan. It gives the boldness and the courage, just like uh, um, Biamak was saying, that, that, that was revealed through Peter. That was also even revealed through Apostle Paul when he was persecuted. He, he, he kept on because he had now received the power, the boldness and the courage through the Holy Spirit. And then it enables us actually to become witnesses of the greatness of Christ. And this is shown from the Old Testament right through to the New Testament, and including us as believers. We now are the witnesses of the power, the glory, and, 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 and the mighty, mightiness or, or, or you know, the goodness of, of, of Jesus Christ. We are also witnesses now, and we should be witnesses of that. Then it, it, the Holy Spirit, in, in acting and enabling also, gave utterances. And it still does give utterances to us. It, it still talks to us, directs us, and, and enables us to, 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 it speaks through us. The Holy Spirit speaks, uh, he speaks, so, sorry, he speaks through us and enabling us to uh, also uh, explain, show, and, 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 and highlight the greatness of God. The Holy Spirit, he, he then reveals the word, he reveals the nature and the character of God to us. And finally, 
uh, what I, I put down was the Holy Spirit, he, he gives guidance to us in fulfilling the will of the word. That is, he gives guidance in, in doing the acts and the works of the Lord, like healing, miracles, signs, and wonders. So I, I, I just got that. While the word is the seed indeed, and the seed is the word, but we need, or I need the Holy Spirit to act it, because the Holy Spirit is the one who enables me or us to act the word according to the word, through the word, by the word. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution, um, Pastor Mac. Maybe to just uh, a, a final question um, for, for Mrs. Mac's commentary. Can we pick something from the fact that Jesus did not need to be born again because he wasn't born in sin, but he still needed the Holy Spirit for his ministry. Is there something that we can pick up there with regards to the importance of the Holy Spirit? Uh, definitely, yes. Um, remember that we, we've said over and over again that Jesus is 100% man and he's also 100% God. So the man part of Jesus it was as limited as the man part of us. Right. He could only be in one place at any one time. Um, he, he, the Bible tells us that he felt hungry, that he felt tired, that uh, he, 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 he felt pain. He uh, tells us that when Lazarus, his friend, died, he felt the pain that we all feel when we, we lose a loved one. Uh, the Bible also tells us that he, he felt uh, the, the pain of the rejection of men. Uh, everything that we feel as men, he felt uh, as a man. So the, the limitations of the flesh were as much in Jesus as they are in us. And that is why before Jesus starts off his ministry, the first thing, that, the last thing that happened to Jesus before he launched off into ministry is that he got baptized by John the Baptist and he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, it, there's a significance of the timing of that event in that because of the limitations of the flesh, Jesus could not fully manifest uh, God. He could not be truly become uh, or fully become the face of God without the enablement of the Holy Spirit. That is why he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as soon as he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he's, he launched off into ministry. And so, yes, because of the limitations of the flesh, Jesus needed the ministry of the Holy Spirit to, for, for him to be able to, to do what God called him to do. Amen. Thank you for that, uh, for that answer. Saints, I'm seeing no hands up. Um, has no one got any questions or any comments? Okay, I have got a question that has just been posted. Let me get to the question now. It's coming from the Mago family. According to Luke 24, was it only in that instance that Jesus needed to open the minds of the disciples so that they could understand? Okay, um, it, was, it was one of the times that Jesus had to open the minds of the disciples so they could understand. And the simple reason is that um, at that time, the Holy Spirit had not fully come. Remember, uh, before the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit visited with people. He would come and he would go. And people would receive partial or temporary revelation depending on the issue that they were dealing with at the time. So. At that time, when Jesus had this interaction with the, with the disciples, the, the Holy Spirit had not come and he had not remained with them. So they had minimum or they had limited ability to really understand the mysteries of the gospel at that time. And that is why Jesus had to open their minds uh, temporarily at that time so that they could get a revelation or they could get an understanding of the spiritual truth concerning the coming of Christ. But... The fullness of the revelation came only after the day of Pentecost, only after the Holy Spirit was released by the Father and remained with the, with, with, with the disciples. And so it is the same with us now. We, we don't have to rely on partial or temporary 
revelation. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has already come and he, he has come in order to remain in us. And for as long as we are open to his ministry, we will continue to receive revelation concerning any aspect or any, any truth that we might be uh, grappling with at any given moment in, our, in time in our lives. Amen. 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 Thank you for that. Um, Pastor Mike, I think I can hand it back to you to just uh, wrap up and give us the main takeaways from the week's lesson, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, thank you very much, Apostle Paul. So in conclusion, today I'm drawing us back to the bag of seeds. We are drawing our attention back to the bag of seeds, and I want us to come to a place of persuasion that as far as life in the kingdom of God is concerned, the seed is the word and the word is the seed. First of all, in the Old Testament, we considered it a bag of seeds. It's, we, we, we identified the seed of life, which gave uh, the first man and woman their identity, purpose, capacity, and boundaries. We, we considered the seed of pursuit and preservation, which God continued to sow even after the fall of man. We considered the seed of the law and prophet, uh, the law and the prophets, um, the law being the schoolmaster to drive people to grace or the tutor. To, or the guardian to drive or, and to preserve humanity and to guide them to grace. And then we consider the seed of the prophecy which foretold of the redemption of mankind through the sacrifice of Christ. We then jumped on into the gospel dispensation where we considered a different uh, uh, form of the seed of the word of God, the seed of eyewitness statements, which confirmed the fulfillment of the seed of prophecy, the fivefold witness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the works and the scriptures, which you considered last week. And today, we have started to consider the seed um, of the grace dispensation or the church age, which is the seed that is planted as we receive revelation from the Holy Spirit. That seed basically reveals Christ as the culmination of all other seed that God had sown in the lives of in the lives of men from every dispensation uh, before. It reveals the sonship of Christ as the foundation of everything that uh, that is concerning the kingdom of God. And so we can conclude that throughout the history of humanity, throughout the different biblical dispensations, God's primary means of relationship with mankind is his word. He relates to us by his word and we cannot foster a relationship with God apart from his word. So the word remains the seed or the foundation of all of God's dealings with mankind throughout the history of humanity. The word is the scriptures inspired and revealed by the Holy Spirit. And that word is therefore spiritual and can only be understood spiritually. So the word and the Holy Spirit are the boundaries within which every believer is supposed to, to operate. The word is a record that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But that same Holy Spirit is the only person who can reveal that word that he inspired to be put on record in the past. So we can say here that the Holy uh, God, his word and the Holy Spirit are just one and inseparable and indistinguishable um, <clears throat> union that expresses themselves in the same way throughout every dispensation. Uh, the, our understanding, the uh, human beings understanding of the word of God differs from dispensation to dispensation simply because they, we had no capacity to fully grasp, grasp the truths of the word of God. But in this dispensation, the dispensation of grace or the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, we, God has empowered us or he has enabled us or he has, he has given us the potential to be able to receive and to communicate the truth of, the, of his word or the truth of the seed of the word of God that was given even in the past when men had limited capacity or ability to fully understand it. So God is only God through his word is inspired and revealed by his Holy Spirit in our lives. So when we submit to the Lordship of Christ or when we submit to God as our father, the test comes in how much we submit ourselves to the word as the truth on which all his kingdom is founded. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that, uh, for that conclusion. Saints, um, our Sunday service is not the only activity we have at Grace and Faith. We have other activities and events going on during the week. And uh, coming up onto the screens now is a slide that shows us the various events that we have during the week. So we have a prayer meeting every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday from 7 to 7.30. 
This is delivered via Zoom. We have our marriage and relationship session on Wednesdays, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., delivered via Zoom as well. We have our men's fellowship on Saturdays from 9 to 10.30. This is uh, delivered via Skype. And we have our weekly kids' church on Sundays from 8.15 to 9.15 a.m. And if any of you have got any queries with regards to any aspect of our ministry, please contact our administrator, Fina. Her number is on the screens now, and she'll be able to give you further information. And with that said, we have come to the end of our service this week. I will ask our gospel ninja, my Mandianike, to come back and close the session for us in prayer. Amen. I shall pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. We thank you for your everlasting love. From everlasting to everlasting, you have chosen to make us the object of your love. And we are seeing it from the scriptures. From the beginning, you have been pursuing us. And up to now, O oh Lord, we thank you that you have chosen to take residence in each and every one of us who have believed on your son, Jesus. And you have chosen that you never leave us and forsake us. You are always there with us and for us. You are always in us. So it is our part, Father, to choose to acknowledge your presence that is always with us. And you have deposited it, everything that you have made, uh, you, you, have, you have given us through Jesus Christ. And we choose to yield to this Holy Spirit that who's in us. We choose to yield to you, God, and we choose to yield to your word so that this life that you have desired for us, we can manifest it and glorify your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.